Hello everyone and welcome to lecture two. This time around we're going to be covering color models, spaces, and profiles. Short lecture today, but uh, these are important things. The reading material that you're assigned for this module goes into great depth on these topics as well as lots of other things that are very important. Uh, definitely don't skip the reading this, this time around. Um, the only reason we're covering this in a lecture right here is these are, these are typically things that people tend to get confused one with, one with another. So I'm going to try to clarify things a little bit and make that uh, a little simpler to understand. And I want to demonstrate a few things as well. So that's our goal. We're going to run through here and talk about some of these things. So many of you that have used Photoshop or any of the design software before have seen these terms at least before. Color models or color modes in Photoshop. Um, color spaces, color profiles. You have these files floating around in your system with an extension of .icc. These are the things that we're going to talk about right now. So first off is color models and modes. Uh, in truth, they're the exact same thing. If you hear the term color mode, what that's referring to is the drop down list in Photoshop of color models that you can choose from. A color model is the, the same thing as a mode. So don't get confused by that terminology. Color models and modes, if I use the term interchangeably, uh, just don't be confused. It's the exact same thing. Okay. So the definition there on the screen might help you understand a little bit more what this is. I'd, I'd encourage you to get familiar with that definition, but to simplify that even further, a color mode is simply all the possible colors that we can build using a set of primary colors or, or hues. So for example, the RGB color mode is everything that you can make by combining different proportions of red, green, and blue. See so okay, same thing all the different colors that you can possibly make with proportional mixes of CMYK or cyan, magenta, yellow, and black ink. Going down the list, LAB is L for luminance, and then we have an A and a B channel for different tints or different colors. And again, we can mathematically map out every possible combination of colors using that, uh, that the set of primary hues. Okay, so that's what a color model is. If you open up the list in Photoshop, you'll see that under the um, image menu, you, convert the, you can convert the mode to grayscale, duotone, bitmap, multi-channel, indexed, and, and others. So this is uh, you know not exhaustive. There's HSB, for example, as well. But there are these are some of the basic color modes. Uh, these are the lists that you get in Photoshop anyway. But a color model, really simply stated, is just what are the basic primary building blocks of a color system. Here's a visual example of the LAB or lab color model. You have a L axis in the center, that vertical axis going up and down, that indicates how bright a color is. That's all that is. As you go out from the center, the further towards the outer radius you have, that is the saturation of that hue. And the angle that it's pointing at, whether that's towards A plus or A minus, or I should say plus A, minus A, plus B or minus B, the direction that you're pointing on that, a kind of a 3D compass, is the actual hue that you're getting. So if we were to map that out, we could we could assign a numerical value essentially to every single location on that. And we're going to kind of do that a little bit here in, in, later on. Okay, so here's a different way of looking at those uh, color models. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see CMYK. We talked about this before. Last time around, we covered additive and subtractive color theory. This is kind of illustrating what's going on. In the graphic, you have a light source here with a full spectrum of color, which to our eye would look white, but it's really a mixture of lots of different colors, all hitting that cyan ink or pigment at the same time, which is going to reflect up some green and some of the blue light, and then our eye is going to interpret that as cyan because we're going to mixture those two. Magenta, same kind of thing. You guys can run, you can pause the video and, and look at those if you want to see detail. But uh, hopefully you get the idea of what's going on with those. Additive color, RGB, is working the same way, except that it's adding light to our eye. So what we're seeing right here is the light that's actually hitting your eye. And when we mix all those colors together in equal proportions, that gives us white. And, uh, you know, red light by itself looks red. Red and blue light together gives us magenta and, and so on. So all the other possible combinations are built by just varying the brightness level of each of those colors, red, green, and blue. You can make a lot of the different colors that way. Over here, this color model, um, this one, HSB, you won't see this as a color mode that you can select in Photoshop. You can't convert your image to HSB, but it is a color model uh, in the sense that we use that to 
characterize all the different colors, to give numbers, to give values to all the different colors that we can uh, mathematically create using a combination of hue in a, in a, in a well, this gets confusing. We'll come back to this bit and saturation and brightness. So we can vary the hue, the saturation and the brightness, and, and we can, uh, you know, give a numerical value to everything. So this looks HSB right now. This is kind of stripped apart into a square and a slider where we can choose a brightness, but really HSB is actually quite similar to this. If we look at it more three dimensionally, instead of having an A and a B axis, if we had a 360 degree compass right here, then the degree value on that compass, this would be zero where red is. It would also be 360 and we can rotate around this to 180 and so on. And then we've got the brightness value here and saturation on this axis. The further out from the center it goes, the more saturated it is. All right, so that's what color modes are, color models. Color space, this is where things get kind of tricky because color spaces and color profiles are very similar. Uh, it's really more about how you use the term uh, than what it actually is. But a color space is, like the slide says, a specific implementation of a color model. So for example, if we take RGB, we can make specific implementations of that color model depending on what we would like to achieve. Uh, for example, Adobe RGB 1998 is one that you guys have probably heard of um, as a working space. A delivery space, another one of those would be sRGB, which is uh, based on the fact that you would want to deliver your files for online use or on device use in sRGB. If you're going to be working on an image or a design in Photoshop or Illustrator or something else, Adobe RGB might be more appropriate, depending on what it is that you're doing. But anyway, the a color space, there's different types of color spaces. So let's go through these one at a time. Working spaces, um, it depends what you're working on. So there's no set rule that says any particular space is a working space other than understanding what its characteristics are and what's going to benefit you the most in your workflow. So Adobe RGB is not a specific space to a device or type of device. It's more about your workflow. Um, an easy way to think about this is Adobe came up with this working space and it's kind of the bread and butter of the Adobe software. That's really oversimplifying what it is. But uh, essentially, if I'm going to be working on a project in a program like Photoshop, where I'm editing raster graphics like photo uh, photographs or images along those lines, continuously toned images, Adobe RGB would be great for that. Profoto, in the name is the word photo, indicates that this is uh, a working space that you might use for editing photos, color correcting, adjusting luminance, things like that. It's a very large gamut color space. We're going to talk about gamut here later on too. Um, but both of those are acceptable for editing photographic type work for designs, whether they're going to end up being printed or go online or whatever they're going to do. C-Lab or Lab, L-A-B, is uh, the one that we looked at earlier. It's a color model based on a luminance channel and an A and a B channel. And that is the most, well, I don't want to speak in extremes, but it is a very comprehensive color model that can also be used as a space to edit. So when you're working, when we're talking about working, we're talking about editing, whether that's doing a layout in InDesign or that's uh, illustrating Illustrator, uh, manipulating photos or making a composite in Photoshop or whatever it is that you're doing. Working indicates, uh, you know, your editing process. Um, you might also choose to work in a CMYK color space like Swap, Standard Web Offset Printing or Press, I should say, that uh, that is, a, you know, entirely dependent on the type of work that you're doing and what your goals are. You just need to be cognizant of what it is exactly that you're trying to accomplish and what that particular limitation that space is going to limit you to or not limit you to. All right. So after we're finished editing our project, whatever that is, whatever our workflow is going to be, somehow it's going to get output. It's going to go somewhere, whether that means that it's a final destination is to show on people's screens as they view a website, or even if it's something like posting your own photos to Instagram where they'll be viewed on a mobile device, uh, you know, that's delivery. If you're going to be printing commercially, whether that's on web offset press or sheet fed press, uh, there's work, there's delivery spaces that are appropriate for that. 
Um, if your your project or your design or your illustration or your photo is going to go on for further work, you might decide to keep that in an appropriate space that is also used for working. So Adobe RGB, for example. Um, it, it entirely depends on your, your role and your workflow and your type of project. For example, if my project that I'm working on at the moment is a, a large format poster, then I might be in contact with the large format shop that's going to be printing it. And I would want to communicate with them and find out what space do they want this file in. When I deliver my file to be printed or produced or manufactured, I need to communicate with the print provider and find out what do they want. Do they need to have this converted to a certain color profile? Do they need to have it in a certain space? That's just entirely dependent on the job and the, the particulars of what it is that you're doing. We'll talk more about limitations of these in a little bit though, so don't worry. You'll, you'll know, hopefully by the end of today's lecture, that you'll know which kind of spaces to avoid for certain types of things and why you would want to. Okay, so if we're, if we're talking about color modes and color spaces and color profiles, um, sometimes I use the analogy of Russian nesting dolls. Those Think of those little tiny wooden dolls where you open one up and there's a smaller, exact, identical, um, painted colorful doll inside that you open that one up there's another inside that you open that up there's another inside that and so on so that's kind of what we're doing so far we're on to color profiles and that's the smallest of these little nesting dolls it's more specific or precise i should say than than the others so again just to recap a color mode is just the generic primary colors the base colors i shouldn't say the word generic but the base primary colors or hues that are used to build everything else RGB, CMYK, grayscale, etc. A color space is just an implementation of a color mode. So kind of generic things like Adobe RGB or uh, sRGB or swap or snap or some others like Grackle. Those are just generic implementations of a color mode that are kind of keyed towards certain types of workflows or um, outputs. Color profiles, we get much more specific than we have before, even though it says generic here on the screen as one of those, it's, it's less generic than anything else so far. So let's start with that. Generic profiles are things like what you might see on your system as monitor RGB. Or if you, if you go to Best Buy and you buy yourself a desktop inkjet printer, you pop that CD, I guess nothing comes with CDs anywhere, but you download and install the driver for that printer, it's gonna install some profiles that say, Epson, SureColor Printer, or Canon uh, Inkjet, or something like that, it's going to have a profile that is kind of keyed into that type of device. And when you run that printer, if you print uh, from your desktop there, you can choose the type of color uh, management that you want. You can turn color management off sometimes, depending on what the driver allows you to do. Or you can choose and say, I'm going to be printing on my desktop Epson printer, and I'm going to be using their... Uh, luster photo paper, or I'm going to be printing this on hot press matte paper, or I can choose the different type of paper that I want to use, but they're still kind of generic because it's not the printer that's sitting on my desk. It's the reference model that Epson or Canon or whoever's engineers tested and calibrated and profiled at their factory. Okay. So custom profiles, getting more specific still, is when we were to, if we were to take an instrument like a X-Rite device and print a test chart, a reference chart on that inkjet printer or on any kind of commercial press, or this works on monitors too, but if we take a device, a piece of hardware, and we measure the actual color characteristics of that device, then we can confidently say that this device's color characteristics are, are such, and that classification, that characterization of that device is stored in a custom profile, an ICC profile. So this should be somewhat familiar to you based on the reading from like chapter one. Uh, you should be kind of familiar with profiles a little bit at least. Uh, if not, then it'd be a good idea to go back and review that. If what I've said so far today is kind of confusing to you, then I would highly recommend that you go back and do a little bit of that reading and study that a little more. Okay. Um, so anyway, the point is that uh, a, a profile that I create manually using software and hardware combination like x provides that is custom to 
a unique device. I can take a, an instrument and I can suction cup it to my own monitor here in my office, run the software, and it's going to display a whole bunch of colored patches on the screen, different brightness values, uh, different grayscale ramps, and that de that device, that instrument, a colorimeter, a spectrophotometer, it's going to observe and measure and record that color information that's displayed on the screen. And it's going to compare that to the values that should actually be displaying on the screen. And if there's any inconsistencies between the two, for example, the software is going to display 100% brightness, pure red. But on my screen, if that comes through with a slight color cast or an imbalance, or it's not quite as bright as it ought to be, then that information is going to be stored in that color profile. And so then if I were to um, correct for that, I can, I can save, I can embed a correction using the software and that ICC profile can correct for that. Uh, when we're talking about commercial printing, a more useful approach would be to print a test chart out. Like a, a IT7 test chart is going to, or IT8 test chart is going to have a whole ton of color patches on it. And we're going to measure all those individual color patches and that's going to tell us exactly what color characteristics or what behavior a certain device or, or printing press is able to, to uh, you know, perform, how its color performance is. And then we use that information to preview it and correct and soft proof and, and other types of things. But anyway, getting to the point, a custom profile is device dependent. That's very, very specific to an individual device. A generic profile is kind of for a class of devices or a certain model, but it's still pretty vague. Um, there's some limitations to that. We're going to talk about those. Standard profiles are things that we would typically call a color space. So they're theoretical. We'll, we'll talk about it. Let's go on to some other slides. Okay. Custom profiles. We talked about this in depth already. I kind of went off there. Um, if you've ever heard somebody talk about calibrating their monitor, what they're doing is they're um, setting a baseline of performance for their device. They're resetting the factory settings, usually resetting it to default. They're characterizing the device with hardware and software. Their instrument is reading the colored patches that are displayed on the screen. And then they're, they're aligning that, they're creating a profile, they're profiling it so that they have a reference point to make corrections or adjustments to that device or to images as they're previewed on that device. So very specific, that's the, that's the kind of baseline of color management. So for our purposes in this class, um, it's an online class, you don't have access to this hardware, but if you would like to get into color management, or I guess I should, should even broaden that, if you are going to be involved in anything relating to visual communication, <laughs> you should at least calibrate your monitor. So obtain a data color or X-ray device. Those are brands that provide this, this information. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about it. Some of it's pretty affordable. Some of that hardware can get pretty expensive. But uh, if you're engaged in visual communication, you're doing work that involves looking at images on your screen that have color, you should calibrate your device. You need to calibrate your screen regularly. You need to check it because over time the color will drift. It'll it'll change. So calibrate that. Um, if you're involved in printing, then you know you're probably going to have access to uh, some kind of printing press that you're going to use to proof with. So you might have a desktop inkjet printer that you do test prints on. That should be calibrated as well. So that if I were to print something on my printer on my desk and then hold that up next to my monitor, there's going to be brightness differences also because again, additive color, subtractive color. We could use a viewing booth, but but the goal is that it's consistent. We want to have the same color on my screen as we have on the print. I could send that file off now that it's been corrected. I could send it off with an embedded color profile to a, a printing press, a commercial printer, and that color is going to match what I got on my desktop printer and that's going to match what's on my screen. So calibration is super, super important. Okay, generic profiles, um, you know, like I said before, these are things that you're going to download from your manufacturer's website. If I purchase some uh, Canon photo paper to use with my printer at home, um, I can go on Canon's website and I can look up that paper. I can download an ICC profile and I can install that. And then 
on my screen, assuming my monitor is calibrated and is showing accurate color, I can preview that file using the profile for the printer for that specific type of paper, and I can see what it's going to look like. Now that's kind of generic just for that paper to be accurate. What I would want to do is actually calibrate my monitor, profile my inkjet printer on my desktop using that specific type of paper, and then I can be a little more precise. I can know the exact conditions for the, the printer I'm using, the inks I'm using, the paper I'm using, and, and so on. All right, moving on. So standard profiles are things like Adobe RGB, sRGB, Profoto, Rec. 709. Those are all RGB uh, standard profiles, color profiles. Often we'll just call these color spaces. Uh, they're still profiles. If it ends in .icc, you can find that file on your hard drive. .icc, that's a color profile. Depending on how we're using it, it's a color space. And this will maybe make more sense when we look over in Photoshop here in a little bit. On the right-hand column, um, there's some profiles that are just kind of standardized profiles for CMYK. So, for example, swap, uh, standard web offset printing or, or uh, press. There's newsprint, uh, grackle, and, and there's others. So these are, these are all entirely dependent on what your workflow is. Color conversions are something that uh, are important in color management. If you've read in chapter three of the textbook, you might see some of these formulas in there. And I only put this on the slide right here to make you panic a little bit. We're not actually going to go into this, and I'm about done with my lecture. <laughs> but uh, color conversion is an important thing. We're going to look at it, but but don't fear. We never have to actually do any of this. Well, I take it back. We will do some math here in this class for sure. But we're not going to do this math definitely on, on a regular basis. And as a designer or a visual communicator, you're you're not going to be considering this on a regular basis. For you know hardcore color management, yeah, you'll be looking into some of this math once in a while. But typically, it's it's simpler. We're going to be just calculating delta E. So you'll see that in chapter three. What we're concerned with and how that math relates is in rendering intents, and we're going to do a little uh, demo here and some color management software that I can show you. Uh, and we'll go through these. So if you've ever taken an image in Photoshop, worked on it, and then you decide to convert to uh, another color space, for example, for output, if, you're, if you've taken GIT 334, then you're familiar with uh, my requirement. And, and it, it's not my requirement. This is just standard industry practice and and best practice for color management is that every file needs to have an embedded color profile. So if you've ever done that, you've seen, whether you clicked on it or not, a drop-down list that contains these items, perceptual, saturation, relative, and absolute color metric. And basically, those are different kind of algorithms for how we convert between color modes or color profiles or color spaces. So we'll take a look at that and see what those mean here in a little bit. So what we're looking at here is the interface of a program called Color Think Pro. It uh, visualizes color spaces and profiles. So it's a useful utility for this class. And if you're getting into technical aspects of color management, it might be useful to you. You can download a, a free trial. There's the demo avail uh, version available. Um, but it's certainly not required. So download it if you want to, but I'm not going to require it for anything. Um, what I'm going to use this for is to illustrate to you what these color spaces and profiles look like and how uh, they interact, especially when it comes to color transformations or color conversions and rendering intents. So um, looking at this view right now, this is just an empty grid view of LAB, the color mode LAB. So this is our conversion space. Anytime we're going from one color mode to another or one color model to another, it goes through LAB. That's how the transformation takes place in Photoshop or InDesign or in your uh, operating system in the color sync module in uh, on Apple's devices or whatever. So um, LAB, that's where it, all the math happens that transforms RGB color values into CMYK color values or vice versa. Okay, so looking at this, I've got a couple of things loaded up already to, to show you, but let me turn on this uh, cloud view this is just a very simplified map of every coordinate through LAB. And you can kind of visualize what those colors are. Um, and, and those are just values of colors. 
Now, if we mapped out every conceivable color that we could mathematically create, this would just be a dense cube with kind of a gradient of colors on the outside. You wouldn't be able to see in between those, so it's very simplified. But uh, that's kind of what the LAB mode is. If we would just mathematically fit that all color into a nice, tidy little cube or square shape, then that's what that is. Okay, so let's turn that off and let's turn on something that's more familiar to you guys, maybe. So this is Swap. It's a CMYK color space and typically something that's going to be used when you're printing to, you know, when you're sending a file to a commercial printer, that is. So commercial printing press, uh, specifically a web offset press, but uh, it gets kind of double duty for lots of different things. Anyways, you can see that we've got, looking from the top, kind of a spike out here in yellow. That means that it is good at reproducing yellow color values because obviously there's yellow ink used in that printing process. We've got a spike over here in cyan, and there's magenta, and the black doesn't quite reach the bottom, and we'll talk about that. With, you know, We know some of the deficiencies already of CMYK, but, but there we can visualize that we can't get pure black, we can't get pure white. And the colors typically aren't terribly saturated, right? But we can make fairly good combinations of yellow and cyan to make green. And we can get kind of a little bit of red with a mix of magenta and yellow. Uh, over here, blues get pretty weak, right? We can't get a whole lot of blue mixing cyan and red together. So anyways, that's, that's um, swap. Let's turn on another color profile, an RGB profile. This one is Adobe RGB. And let me zoom out a little bit because it's even bigger. You see the outline there on the bottom? That indicates the gamut of this space. The gamut is just the outermost limit of, of the space if we're mapping it in three dimensions. But what that means is how bright and how saturated and how light and how dark. What are the extreme colors of that color system? In this case, the color space. Adobe RGB. And so it's much more vibrant, much more saturated, much brighter than uh, than Swap. And let me turn this on to a wireframe view so you can see through. So imagine for a second if we're taking a, an image that we've, we were trying to prep for print and it's got really bright, vibrant greens in it. You can imagine they're just not going to print on a piece of paper. So we'll get to what happens there, but we can achieve pure white with uh, emissive color, additive color, because if, if we're, you know, our screen is displaying 100% white, then that's just light going straight into our eyeballs. Same thing with black. Absence of light down here at the very bottom, we can get black because we just don't use any light whatsoever. Okay, so there's, there's visually the difference between an RGB space and a CMYK space is, is very noticeable, right? And these aren't, that's not even a, a large gamut space, Adobe RGB. Okay, so I'm going to do something else now. Let me jump over to Photoshop real quick. And I've got a couple of files loaded up here. So this file is just a simple gradient. This gradient goes from red, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and on all through the, the color wheel and ends at red again. And then we've got a white gradient at the top and a black gradient at the bottom. And I want to show you what that looks like when you map it out. So putting that into our software here, let me turn off these others. We turn this guy on. That's what this looks like. Now, the reason that's so big, it's even bigger than Adobe RGB, is because, oh, I think I just crashed this off. What do we do? It's hidden inside of there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's turn this on to full color. I've been crashing this program regularly. <laughs> All right. So there's Adobe RGB. And the colors in my file that I loaded up exceed that by quite a bit. Uh, so this file that I that I showed you with that simple gradient, those are very bright, vibrant colors that are actually outside of the spectrum, outside of the gamut that Adobe RGB can contain. They're in another color space called Pro Photo RGB, which is even larger. And you can see that it almost, you know, it, it touches the edges over here of our chart. The blue almost goes outside the green, goes clear to the edges. Uh, Pro Photo is kind of a theoretical like all these are, these generic or these standard color spaces, they're, they're mathematical constructs. They're theoretical. 
if we were to build something with all these possible color values, this is what we would get. Now to actually like take a photograph that has all those colors would be impossible. Even a, a rainbow isn't that bright or saturated, you know, a naturally occurring rainbow. It's very, very unlikely that you'll get an image that has a whole lot of those really crazy, saturated, bright, vibrant colors. Um, but this is just to illustrate kind of the point. Now, the next image that I'm going to show you over here, jump back to Photoshop, is this one. And it's just a posterized version of the same thing, simplified, so that we don't have so many different colors. We've reduced the number of color values in our image. So let me turn this one off here, turn this one off. And this is the same thing loaded up, but just was with fewer transitions, fewer color points. Okay. Same thing though, lots of really saturated colors in there, bright colors. Now I'm going to come here and turn on another one. Let's go to newsprint. And we know newspaper, like think of the paper that the newspapers are actually printed on. Those of you that have seen one of those in the past few years, newspaper is not high quality paper, like the paper itself, the material, the substrate, it's kind of grayish. Uh, images that get printed on it aren't very bright and vibrant because the paper itself is somewhat like paper towel. If you put a droplet of wet ink on it, it's just going to sink in and spread out. So it's hard to get a very good color. Plus the paper itself is not glossy. It's not reflective. It's not going to bounce a lot of light off. And without a lot of light bouncing off of your substrate, you just can't get very bright color. So let's miss. Oh no, I think I screwed up this offer again. <laughs> Slice it in half. Okay, so lots of vibrant colors. If we were going to take that gradient, that image from Photoshop, let's take this image and print it on newspaper. I want to know what's going to happen to all those colors. So we can do this a couple of different ways. First, we're going to do it in the software, then we'll do it in Photoshop. All right, so I'm going to come here and switch this to vectors on my image which is going to map the transformation from one color profile to another. So the image itself, every dot that you see in this image is a different color of pixel from the actual photo. That's what, that's what being mapped out right now. In case I didn't make that clear. I want to see what's going to happen to all these colors, those blues and greens and purples, where they're going to go if we were to print that on newspaper. So I'll come over here and choose newsprint. All right, and this pin cushion or this underwater creature or whatever alien is representing exactly what's going to happen to all those colors. So these reds and purples and blues, they're all going to be moved in. Let me zoom out maybe. So that's the extent of the color transformations that are going to happen. This green right here is going to go to that. What well, looks like gray to us in comparison. On newspaper, it's not actually going to be gray, but comparatively so that we can actually see it in the software on our monitors it's accentuated so yeah this looks gray right here this is just a gray shape it's not truly gray in print but compared to this bright vibrant green out here yeah it's kind of gray all right anyway so the point i want to get to here is rendering intent so let me see if i can zoom in and avoid crashing all right do you see that line right here this outermost edge of this shape that indicates the most saturated point on this. Okay. So a lot of different vectors are kind of converging at that outermost point on this shape. All right. And that has to do with our rendering intent. So let me change this rendering intent to another one. Switch it. Don't watch the drop down list. Watch over here where those greens are hitting. Okay. If I switch that to perceptual, then you see that a lot of those greens shift to a different location. So what's happening is based on the rendering intent, we're going to stay absolutely true to the original colors as best we can and just reduce their saturation or perceptual. Some of those colors are actually going to shift so that a green that is, you know, 20% different from another green when we're looking out here, like for example, this green and this green are very different, right? 
they don't look like it on the screen, but in reality, those two greens are very, very different, right? When we get down here to the final converted version, those greens, there's not a whole lot of difference. You can't see which points those are. I should make this simple file with just two points maybe to illustrate this better. But anyways, saturation, you see there's a difference there too. Relative and absolute color metric, there's a color shift with each of those. So depending on what exactly it is you're trying to achieve, you might have different problems with this. You might choose a different rendering intent. All right, so just to, uh, the quick short version of this is don't use saturation. It's never gonna give you a good result unless what you're doing is a, you know, a, a, a bar chart or something with just simple colors in it where it really doesn't matter what the colors are. You just want them to be as saturated as possible. If you're working with photographs and you don't need to match a certain color, Perceptual works really well because that's going to give you the most uh, natural looking transitions between colors over drastic color conversions. Relative and absolute com color metric are going to be almost identical for the majority of images. But depending on whether you're working with like a specific color, like a brand color, a photograph of a product with a spot color printed on its packaging may be an issue where you're gonna to need to be careful about which one of these you choose, absolute color metric versus relative, and we'll look at the difference maybe in a photo here. So let's jump over to Photoshop now. And let's go back to this one. So just to give you an idea of what those colors are, I'm gonna to switch to my info panel here and show you, oops, wrong one. So where's my info panel? All right, so let me bring the info panel out. And as I put my cursor over these different colors, you can see in the info panel what those RGB values are. So right there, we've got the very edge 255 red. In the center of that blue, if I can find the right spot, it's 255 blue. And it's just a gradient of solid colors and there's white and black up top, right? Okay, so anytime we are going to be converting the color in an image. This is important. What we want to do is go to edit, convert to profile. And then we can choose what profile we want to convert this to. So if I were to convert this from right now, it's currently in pro photo. It's a very large gamut color space. If I wanted to go to sRGB, let me turn the preview on and off. You can see on the display a shift in color. Now, whether we trust that or not just depends on whether my monitor is actually calibrated or not, but we can turn it on and off and, and get an idea. If we go to something else like swap, you'll see that change is even more drastic. Now, assuming my monitor and your monitor that you're watching this on is, is properly calibrated, then we can assume that what we're seeing on the screen is very similar to what we would get in print. And we're gonna start getting some really bad artifacts here. Like look at the blue, gets this weird shape in it. And, and, and the greens, there's these weird blocking effects. Now that's a big color transformation. Let's make it even worse. Let's go down here and find newsprint. Okay, an even bigger transformation. But let's switch between these rendering, rendering intents. Perceptual, saturation, relative and absolute. You can see there's a big difference between those two. Absolute is gonna to try to keep the hue as close as possible. So that's what gives us these kind of solid chunks of the pure hue as best as possible. Relative is gonna do the same thing in trying to give us the most accurate color, but it's gonna be relative to the extent of that color conversion or transformation. Saturation is just gonna try and get the most saturation possible out of it, regardless of what those hue or colors turn into. And perceptual is gonna try and give the most natural thing that's gonna look pleasing. So uh, again, you'll, you're gonna just wanna be aware that those are there as, as options when you're using rendering intents. Don't change the engine to something, just keep it on Adobe. Um, and then black point compensation, uh, again, this just kinda of depends on whether you're printing or whatnot, but these are, Topics for another day. All right, let me cancel that. I don't actually want to convert those colors just yet. I just want to show you one other thing. 
is when you're working in Photoshop and other applications have similar features too, but let's go to view proof setup and in proof setup. If we click on custom, we can have a list to choose from turn on the preview here and without actually converting any of the colors in this image, we can just preview what they would look like. So if we want to see what this would be on swap, we can do that. We can check, we can preview the different rendering intents. Now the, the difference here is that if we convert the profile, that's permanent. And we may not want to stick with a certain rendering intent. Uh, we may need to make further edits along the way to this. We just want to see what this file is going to go to when it goes to production, when it goes to press. Um, which leads me to the last thing that I wanted to cover real quick with you guys in this lecture is that your working space, let's go file. And actually it's going to be in slightly different place depending on which version of the program you're in. But let's look at uh, edit color settings. All right. And just a disclaimer for those of you that are in any of my other classes right now, going into color settings, this is not going to have any effect whatsoever on an image that I'm working on currently. So this doesn't change anything in that gradient photo image that I'm working on right now. These are just kind of preferences for how Photoshop operates. So in your color settings, it's a good idea to set this up on a machine that you consistently work on. We're going to set the color settings to general purpose two for North America, but then we can modify this depending on, on what things are appropriate for your workflow. For example, um, I tend to work with raw photos. I want the absolute biggest color gamut possible. So I'm going to change my working space to pro photo because all of my work, all of my edit in Photoshop on photos is, you know, high color stuff. I want to keep that color until the very end for printing. When I am printing commercially, if I'm going to send this somewhere, then I'm going to be using something like Grackle. Grackle is a little bit better color, uh, wider gamut, I should say, not better necessarily than swap, but it's going to give you a little bit more color. Um, color management policies, whenever we're bringing in an image, we want to preserve what's embedded. We want to assume that the image we got has the profile that it should. If there's a mismatch, we can say ask when opening and pasting. If it's missing a profile that doesn't have one already, we should say ask when opening. And I'm going to ignore the rest of this stuff for right now and leave it alone, but I could just hit okay. I'm not going to actually change the settings right now so I can come back and go through this for another class, but, um, this will give me kind of the, this little safer workflow for what I want to do. If I'm a designer and everything I do is going to be printed on, uh, for example, on a web offset press or on a screen printer for t-shirts or something, then my pro my working space might be a little bit different. Now, all this is doing is saying when I create a new document or when I import a file in, or when I copy and paste a photo into Photoshop, what behavior do I want it to take? I still need to be aware of what the actual image is that I'm working on and what the color profile is and what I'm converting it to. So for working, you want to work in the widest gamut that's reasonable for the type of work that you do. If you're not working on, um, you know, landscape photos, photos with skin tone, product photos or whatever, things with lots of color, then you may not need pro photo, in which case your working space, you might use Adobe RGB. So this image is pro photo, but when I'm done with it and I want to save this, I want to send a copy to, uh, you know, a web developer or to, uh, post it on my own social media or whatever. I'm going to convert it to sRGB cause it's going to go online. So that would be my delivery space. So same image, I would go ahead and convert that and then save as, you know, a JPEG or whatever file format I'm going to send out. And then, and then I'm done. Anyway, there's a lot, this is a topic that we could spend a whole lot of time on. This isn't really a Photoshop or a tools class. Um, so I don't want to get involved in this too much, but hopefully we can involve some of the stuff in our further projects. And, and this is uh, useful to you, but definitely, definitely don't skimp on the reading this week. Chapter three, you should be pretty familiar with the topics there. And if you if you're late getting your textbook, you want to go back and, and do chapters one and two as well and get very familiar with that content.